right, Numbers chapter 2. Numbers chapter 2. Numbers chapter 2. See how far we can get tonight. We started Numbers last week and we uh, covered how the theme of it is is journeying with Jesus. The whole idea of of how we're going to get from you know, where we are, where we got saved, to, to growing in the Lord and entering into that abundant life that, that the Lord has for us. And so we're get, we see here that in the book of Numbers that, you know, the Lord is trying to take Israel to that place. They've, they've come out of Egypt, they're no longer slaves, but now how do a slave people become a victorious people, you know? How, how do you get from there to there? And so we're going to begin that journey with Israel, and we're going to see that the first generation will, will fail in that, and then the second generation will rise up and succeed. So we're going to go through some failures and see that it, no, it doesn't work, and we're going to see later on then what does work as we look at these two generations. But we started the book of Numbers by looking at the census of that first generation before they moved toward the promised land. Each tribe was represented by a man whose name, uh, all their names, serve as important reminders uh, if they were going to find success when they reached their destination. And in your bulletin tonight, you may have noticed I put all those in there for you because I had quite a few people ask me and say, oh, I, I couldn't write them all down as you were saying them. So, so you've got them now. And what great encouragement to, you know, kind of put up on the mirror in the bathroom or something or up by the, the fridge just to remind you every day of things you need to remember, you know, if we're going to get from, you know, our, our start to our finish. Okay. So good things to be reminded of. Now, again, even though they're goal was to reach your destination. We know how that story ends. They forgot those truths about God. They forgot those truths about each other and they never made it. But that doesn't mean that God failed to do his part. He gave them every chance to succeed. And so before they ever move forward, we see how God does all that. He prepares them for success. And so as God prepares them to move forward, you know, let's not just be counted. They were counted. The problem was they couldn't be counted on. So let's be those who can be counted on by keeping him at the center of all we do. So Numbers chapter 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. And so what we see here is before they're ever going to move anywhere, God's going to teach them how to camp. You might be saying, well, that's kind of silly. You know, <clears throat> yeah, why would they need to learn how to camp? Well, remember, this is going to be doing things God's way, not their way. And, you know, and frequently after we get saved, we run into that problem, right? You know, we, we, we understand Jesus loves us. We understand our sins are forgiven. And then the Holy Spirit's living inside of us and he starts, he starts, to, he starts to fiddle, doesn't he? He starts to start putting his finger on things and says, now, Will, you know, I, I saw how you kind of, you know, you, you gave uh, some creative, you know, fi- uh, sign language to that individual, you know, when he cut you off earlier today. And now that's not what I want you to do. You know, I would like you to be kind to people and forgiving to people and gracious to people. He starts to fiddle. He starts to change us. He hits us right at home. And so the Lord here is going to teach him how to camp. And so the general setup for the camp we see here in verses one and two. Every Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard. Now, I love this because every person in the camp is important if they were to reach their destination. Everybody had to be in their place. Every person. Not a single person was unimportant. Now, where was their place? Well, it says every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard. There would be a banner that God would assign. Uh, and we're going to learn in a second how God would assign that. In fact, I've got, a, I got, I got slides tonight. Let's put the first one up. It's right there. Only the righteous can see it. So if you can't see it. (laughs) My mind's been blank most of the day. Maybe I sent blanks like, there we go. All right. So this is the arrangement of the camp of Israel. And if you'll notice, every side has three tribes. Okay. So, and, and every set of three would kind of have like a a leading tribe that would kind of lead the way. And so there would be a standard that would kind of be their standard. For example, on the east side, 
You have Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, and they, their standard was the lion, which was Judah's standard. And so that's where you would be. You would be with the lion. So they, every man of the children of Israel shall pitch their tent, basically camp out, by their own standard. But notice it says, with the ensign of their father's house. So God will assign four banners, one for each side, north, south, east, and west, with three tribes assigned to each banner, but they still need to remain in their tribal camps. So it's like Issachar couldn't blend with Judah. They still needed to stay with Issachar, okay? So they all had to stay with their families, even though they would all be, they'd be on the same side as these two other tribes that they'd be partnered with. And so, uh, you know, this is fascinating because it shows that everyone doesn't do the same thing, but we're all still a part of the whole. The Bible stresses both the importance of the individual and the importance of community. This is a lesson we've actually been learning on in, in 1 Corinthians, which is why Numbers is the companion book in the Old Testament to 1 Corinthians. Just like, remember, Hebrews was the New Testament companion book to Leviticus. Same thing here. Numbers and 1 Corinthians go together. Because, you know, it's important to understand that. See, the Corinth people, they were all about me. It was all about self. And, and, and you know, there's a sense where, God loves you, and so you're important because of that, but we should not have this sense of self-importance and this sense of selfishness, and, and, you know, and, and everything's about me. You are important, but not all by yourself. Both the individual and the community find their goal when every person is where God wants them to be. And so before we even get started into all this stuff tonight, you know, are you being faithful to be where God's placed you? You know, I remember I heard a sermon at Bible college where it was about the grain of wheat that falls into the ground and it has to, you know, the grain of wheat, if it's gonna ever bring forth fruit, it has to, it has to die and then bloom where it's been planted, right? And a whole sermon was on that. The whole sermon was on the idea of, and he went through the scriptures of men that God called and, and, they, and, and the idea is they were put where they were sent, you know? And, and they grew and they, they flourished because they stayed where God told them to be. You know, and it's, sometimes we, we chafe at where God wants us to be. We don't like where our marriage is at this point in time, or we don't like where, where our family is. We don't like where our job is. We don't like where our place even in the church might be or in the community. And you know, God, he calls us to a place at times because it's best for us and it's, it's best for others because he knows what's best for us. So are you being faithful to be where God has placed you, to flourish right where he's got you? Now, Notice here it mentions that there's one difference between the way our community is ordered and their community. It mentions that they're all going to be around the tabernacle, but it says far off around the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. You know, they had to stay far off with the Levites providing a buffer zone between God and them. We'll learn about that in chapter 3. But the Levites were the buffer zone on the inside. You know, this was to avoid a casual approach to a relationship with God. For too casual approach betrays too minimal a reverence. You know, we're invited to enter God's presence with boldness, right? We're not called to stay far off, right? There's no buffer zone between us and God. There's nothing between us. There's one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus. And he draws us near, right? We are brought near by the blood of Christ. So we're invited to come right into the Holy of Holies, right into God's presence with boldness, and yet not with casualness, never casualness. You know, Charles Spurgeon wrote a book about the throne of grace. And one of the things he talks about there is he goes, isn't it wonderful that we come to a throne of grace, but we must never forget that it's a throne and on it sits our king. We must never forget that. We come boldly, but we never come casually. We always come respectful and reverential to our father. Now, verse three, here we get to the camp. It says, now on the east side, toward the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies. And Nashon, the son of Aminadab, shall be captain of the children of Judah. We already met him earlier in chapter one. And his host and those that were numbered of them were threescore and 14,600. You know, at least then it's interesting when you're doing the math, you know, because you got to figure out what in the world does a score mean, you know? And uh, if I remember correctly, it's 20. So the idea here of threescore and 14,000, it would be 74,600 men from the tribe of Judah. So they would be camped there. And those that do pitch next unto him shall be of the tribe of Issachar. And Nethaniel, the son of Zuar, shall be captain of the children of Issachar. And his host and those that were numbered thereof were 54,400. Why didn't it? See, I always wonder why the King James does that sometimes. Why didn't it say two score and 14? I don't know. But somebody's awake. 
Well, then next will be the tribe of Zebulun, and Eliab, the son of Helon, shall be the captain of the children of Zebulun. And his host and those that were numbered thereof were 57,400. All that were numbered in the camp of Judah were 100,000 and fourscore thousand and 6,000. So 186,400 throughout their armies. These shall set forth first. So Judah's standard became the camp for the first three tribes in the east side, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. Is that right? No. Yes, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. And notice here it mentions that they would be next to each other. Now, here it lists them side by side. Um, This is the traditional way of viewing things, but some actually think it was behind each other. I don't know which one it was. The rabbis don't know which one it was. Uh, But I'll give you an interesting thought at the end of the sermon of why it might be the other way and not side by side. But notice here also, it mentions at the end in verse 9 that these were the guys who would set forth first. This was the largest of the four camps. So they led the way when the host traveled. These were the guys who were the foreguard. They were in the front. They led the way. This is also in accord with Jacob's prophecy that Judah would get the prominence among his older sons because Reuben, Simeon, and Levi were disqualified by their wicked behavior. Now, you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, oh, wait a second, Will. I know the story of of Judah. Didn't he do wickedly with Tamar? I mean, he ended up, you know, sleeping with her, you know, and she was his daughter-in-law, you know? Well, yes, he did, but he also repented. Later on, remember when Benjamin came to Egypt, Judah offered his own life to spare Benjamin so that he could go home. Isn't that the same thing that Jesus does for us? He offers his life that we might be spared. And so as Judah gets the preeminence among the tribes, so Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is the head of the church. It is he who leads us on this journey. It is our job to follow him. He sets forth first and we follow him. Amen? Well, the next camp is the southern camp, verse 10. And on the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben, according to their armies. So again, we have some redemption here for Reuben because even though he is originally the firstborn and but that blessing was removed because of his sin, Jacob gave it to Judah. Here we see him though, he's still one of the leading tribes. On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of of Reuben, according to their armies. And the captain of the children of Reuben shall be Eliezer, the son of Shadur. And his host and those that were numbered thereof were 46,500, much less than Judah. And those that who, which pitched by him shall be of the tribe of Simeon. And the captain of the stri- children of Simeon shall be Shelumiel, the son of Zuri Shaddai. And his host and those that were numbered of them were 59,300. Then next, the tribe of Gad. And the certain captain of the tri- sons of Gad shall be Eliasaph, the son of Reel. And his host and those that were numbered of them were 40 and 5,650. All that were numbered in the camp of Reuben were 100,000 and 51,450 throughout their armies. And they shall set forth in the second rank. So they camped on the south here. And you see their numbers there. So they've got a total of 151,000. So about 35,000 less than the east. So they would go second. When they would march, it would be the east side first, then the south side. So anybody from the east side? All right, you're still awake. Okay, good. Had a few more chuckles that time. All right, now we get to the middle camp, verse 17. Then the tabernacle of the congregation shall set forward with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camp, in the middle. As they encamp, so shall they set forward every man in his place by their standards. So the Lord's camp would always be in the center of their march. In the center of their camp would be the tabernacle. That's where God's presence, his Shekinah glory would dwell. Surrounding the tabernacle would be the Levites and then the rest of the tribes of Israel. So first would march the camp of Judah with their three tribes, then the camp of Reuben with their three tribes, and then the middle would pick up and they would begin uh, to, to move out right in the center, right in the midst. So the Lord's camp would always be at the center of their marches with six tribes in front and six tribes behind. And yet, it would not be Judah that would start the marches. He, it's not like if Judah got up and said, time to go, they would go. Notice here it mentions, as they encamp, so shall they set forward. Every man in his place by their standards. It would always be the Lord that controlled their march. Every man ordered themselves around the center. And that's interesting because maybe God 
calls you to be kind of like a, you know, a Judah person where you're gonna be out in the front, you're gonna lead. Or maybe he might call you to follow. You might not be the one that's out in the front. Your role may be visible or behind the scenes, but he's the one who gives our marching orders. So it's our job to follow them, whatever they may be. And, and are you and I content with that? Are we cool with God setting the marching orders? Frequently, I have people who will come, they wanna set up a meeting with me, pastor, I need to meet with you. And I'll say, Pastor Will, you know, I'm having all these issues, having all these difficulties. And I'll say, okay, tell me what's going on. And they'll share their story. And I say, okay, all right. Now, you realize there's a couple areas here where you're violating some of God's principles. And I'll read some scripture to them. And I'll say, so, you know, if you, if you get in line with these things, I think what you'll find is you'll find that you'll find a lot more stability and in, in you're moving forward. And they'll just start to shake their head and say, well, now, Pastor Will, I understand that God says that, but you don't understand how my life works. They want to call the shots. They want to be the one that sets the marching orders. And it never works that way. I have watched time and time, pardon me, time and time and time again, where people have said, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And it never works out. I have sat down with people who have looked me in the eye and said, well, I understand God's word says that, but I'm going to do this. And they're shocked. They are back in my office, not even six years later, because that relationship that was bad that they went into and they said, it'll work out fine or the way they're doing it's fine. Now they're headed for divorce or now, and it's just, you, you're baffled because you're like, why are you, what, what do you mean? What do you mean you're surprised this happened? <laughs> Frequently, those very same people are angry at God that things aren't working out well. Why did God do this to me? I, I, that phrase I have heard in particular. Why did God do this to me? Time out. God didn't do anything. In fact, he laid out and said, please don't do this. This is headed for trouble. And you said, I don't care. I know better than you, God. So why are you upset with him? God, it's always the reason he sets the marching orders is because he knows what's best for us. You know, we're going to get to a story in the book of Numbers where the people are whining and crying because they can't find any water anywhere. And they get to this, this oasis. They find it and they get there and the water's bad. They can't drink it. It's, it's not good, you know. And they just give Moses what for. And, and the Lord, you know, it turns out that just over the next sand dune, there's a beautiful oasis. And so often it's like that with us where the Lord's saying, no, 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 I've got great things for you, it's good, just trust me, follow me. No, God, I, I've been walking for miles and there's nothing here, you know? And then what happens? We come crest over the ridge, whining and complaining, and the Lord set up a beautiful pavilion for us. You know, God is good all of the time. It's just simply whether we'll trust him or not. And God tests us at times. You know, will you walk with me even when it's desert? Will you walk with me when you don't see how I'm working? Will you trust me that I love you and I'm gonna take care of you? Are we content with that? We need to be. Well, the next camp is the west side. And on the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim, according to their armies. And the captain of the sons of Ephraim shall be Elishama, the son of Amihud. And his host and those that were numbered of them were 40,500. 40, and by him or next to him shall be the tribe of Manasseh. And the captain of the ch children of Manasseh shall be Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur. And his host and those that were numbered of them were 32,200. You can see the numbers up there. Then uh, the tribe of Benjamin was right next to them. And the captain of the sons of Benjamin shall be Abidan, the son of Gideonai. And his host and those that were numbered of them were 30 and 5,400. All that were numbered of the camp of Ephraim were 100,000 and 8,000 8, and, and 100 throughout their armies. And they shall go forward in the third rank. So after the middle camp is moving, then it says the next camp, the west camp will pick up. And they had 108,000. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 108,100. So they will be third. Now, what's interesting about that camp is they were, they were very small. In fact, uh, they're the smallest of the three camps that are up there. And, uh, and that just goes to show you that, uh, you know, the Lord doesn't count the smallest last. And sometimes you might think, well, I, I don't, like remember Gideon, the Lord came to him and said, you know, Gideon, how a mighty man of valor. He goes, mighty man of valor. He goes, I, I'm the smallest guy in, in my family from the smallest, you know, family in the neighborhood. You know, what do you mean, mighty man of valor? I'm nobody, you know? And the Lord says, no, 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 I, I've, I, you're a mighty man of valor. I've called you, I'm gonna use you. And the Lord did use him. Don't ever let what you think to be your abilities or your influence or, or your success possibility, probability, be what sends you forward to obey the Lord. Just do what God says. 
Whatever he calls you to do, just be faithful to trust him and to do it. The last camp is the north camp, verse 25. And the standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side by their armies. And the captain of the children of Dan shall be Ahiezer, the son of Amishadai. And his host and those that were numbered of them were threescore and two thousand and seven hundred. And those that encamp by him shall be the tribe of Asher. And the captain of the children of Asher shall be Pagiel, the son of Okran. And his host and those that were numbered of them were forty and one thousand and five hundred. Then the tribe of Naphtali, and the captain of the children of Naphtali shall be Ahira, the son of Enon. And his host and those that were numbered of them were 50 and 3,400. All they that were numbered in the camp of Dan were 100,000 and 50 and 7,000 and 600. They shall go hindmost with their standards. Now, it's interesting because God doesn't say they shall go forth so he doesn't hurt their feelings. He says, these shall go last. <laughs> he just comes out and says it. You guys, you're last, you know? God doesn't call it forth because he doesn't want them, them coloring their position by a different name. They are last. Now, it's interesting, though, that even though they're last, this is the only group that God reminds to march with their standards. Now, they're all supposed to march with their standards, but why does he remind them? Well, he's reminding them that he picked them for this role. You're the vanguard. You're in the rear. Yes, you're last, but I picked you there, and I have reasons for putting you there, so you hold your standard high, you know? You hold your standard high and you make sure you carry it. You don't, you know, there are times when, you know, especially you'd see it with kids, you know, and they want to do something and, and you say, okay, you can do it, you know, or, or you can do it. And then the other ones, they all go, what? Oh, you know, like that's a forbidden sound in my family. We don't allow, oh, you know, and the second I hear it, I go, what is that? There's none of that here. I was like, we made a choice and you need to be all in. We're part of the family. This is how we do it. This is your role. This is their role tonight. That's how we're going to roll. And God didn't want them doing that. Last, you know, we get to pull up the rear, you know. We're not ever going to get to see, everybody gets to see everything before us. Everybody gets to, you know, go somewhere before we get there. You know, and, and Reuben's slow as all get out. <laughs> There's a difference between grudgingly doing what God tells you and proudly carrying your banner for him, whatever it may be. You know, it's interesting. I always chuckle that, that I have a public ministry in the sense that I, I'm up front. Like, you have to listen to me for the next however many minutes. That baffles me because that's not a role I crave. I like being more behind the scenes, just doing the quiet stuff. I like stacking chairs, cleaning up. You know, that's where my heart was always at. I had no desire to be a pastor. You know, but God frequently puts us in the places that he knows are best for us, the place where we'll know him better and have to trust him more. And God wants us not to grudgingly do those things, but to proudly carry the banner he's put before us and to say, Lord, I will do whatever you call me to do and I'm happy to do so, you know? You call me to be last, be the vanguard, I'll be the vanguard, you know? And have you embraced the role that God's given to you? Sounds like a broken record tonight, doesn't it? <laughs> All of these things are possible when I keep Jesus at the center to have that right attitude. But when I don't have that right attitude, pride, hurt, Frustration, they all start to creep in. Why didn't Pastor Will pick me for that job? I, people, I offend people all the time without realizing it, you know? And I, I say, someone will come to me and say, hey, I've got this idea to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And I say, oh, great, run with it. You know, and someone else comes to you and says, Pastor Will, I wanted to do that. Why didn't you ask me to do that? I'd have done that for the last three years, you know? I, I didn't know you wanted to do that, you know? But that's the problem when we don't embrace the role that God's given to us. Say, Lord, I'm cool with whatever you got for me. Pride and hurt and all those things, frustration, they start to creep in. And I would encourage you tonight, you know, if that's already been the case with you, it's time to put Jesus in the center of all you do again. You know, because really in the end, your problem isn't with, with you know, your boss or with, you know, your, your, your community neighborhood leader or, you know, or your parents or, you know, or, or your spouse or me. You know, your, your problem is, is with him. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. It comes from the Lord. What I found is if you just keep trucking and being faithful, the Lord raises you up in his perfect time. In his perfect time. So let's see if they can get the first part right. Verse 32. 
These are those which were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers. All those that were numbered of the camps throughout their hosts were 600,000 and 3,550. But the Levites were not numbered among the children of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses. God told Moses, don't count them. We'll find out in chapter three. And the children of Israel, what? They did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. Yay. Be the only thing they get right. <laughs> So they pitched it by their standards. They ordered themselves in the way that Moses said. And so they set forward everyone after their families according to the house of their fathers. They started it off right. A good start. While a good start's important, God, though, is more interested in how you and I finish. Turn to Matthew 21 with me. Matthew 21. You know, it's interesting, if we, before the Lord tarries, if we ever get to the kings in the Old Testament... We're going to see so many kings that started awesome. Like they, like Asa, Uzziah, guys that were just godly men and brought reforms in their nation and did great things, mighty men of God. And they finished horribly. They died old, bitter, grumpy, disobedient men. And God does not desire that for us. He wants us to finish well. Matthew 21, verses 28 to 32. The religious leaders had questioned Jesus' authority. And so Jesus poses to them a, a parable, a question in the form of a parable. He says, guys, what do you think? He said, a certain man had two sons, verse 28. He came to the first and said, son, go to work today in my vineyard. But the son answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and he went. Now he came to the second son and said, likewise. And the second son said, all right, I'll go, sir. But he didn't go. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? Which of the two did what his, God, his dad wanted him to do? Well, they said to him, well, the first, of course, even though he started off bad, he finished well, he repented. Jesus said to them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots, they believed him. And you, when you had seen it, you did not repent afterward that you might believe him. Like you saw God doing this awesome work and you came and you questioned everything. Instead of going, you know, oh, maybe we got this wrong. The sinners are coming and repenting. They're coming to God. But that offends us because, well, then we'll be in the same boat as the sinners. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to be publicly shamed and, and, and grouped with the sinners. So we're going to question everything John the Baptist does, even though we know he's from God. He says, you know what you guys are? You're like that son that God said, hey, go do this. This is how I want you to live. And they said, all right, God, we'll do whatever you say. But then you do whatever you want. He said, I'd rather you be these guys who God said, do this. And they said, no, I'm gonna do it my own way. And then the Lord convicted them and they repented and they went and did it God's way. You know, a good start is great, but God's very interested in how you and I finish. And so, you know, if the Lord were to take you home today, would you be able to say you finished well? You know, we had Jane and Marty's memorial this week, and I tell you, I, after it was all over, it was quite a bit emotional for me personally. And uh, I just was reminded, you know, we had a, I had a Sunday school teacher when I was newly saved, and uh, she had us do this, uh, you know, this project where, you know, we needed to write down what would you like your tombstone to say? And what would you say your tombstone, you know, that was you to write, what would you want it to say, you know? And then afterwards said, now what do you think people would write on your tombstone? <laughs> and I was a messed up teenager at the time, you know? So I wrote down, what do I think people would write down on my tombstone is, this was a guy who had no clue where he was going and wasn't making anywhere and he just died, you know? What did I want people to say? That I finished well, I knew where the Lord you know, wanted me to go and I followed him every step of the way. And, you know, it reminded me of that, you know, death does that to you. It kind of makes you try to put things in perspective. You know, I want to finish well. I want to be able to say with the Apostle Paul who said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race that God set before me. I've kept the faith. You know, at the end of my days, I want my tombstone to say one thing. This guy loved Jesus all the way to the end. That's it. It's all thing I want to be known for. Not a good pastor, not, not a great teacher, none of those things. I want to say this guy loved Jesus all the way to the end. Because in pastoring for 22 years, I have watched many men 
who started off awesome and are, they are literally corpses on the side of the road right now. I don't want to be one of them. I want to finish well. I want to finish strong. Now, we had that little remark there that the Levites would not be counted. And it wasn't that God didn't count them or they weren't important to him. They were very important to him. But their role would be vastly different from all the other tribes. So they would be counted in a different place. Chapter 3, verse 1. These are also the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day that the Lord spoke with Moses in Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron. Nabab, the firstborn, and Abihu, and Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the priests which were anointed, whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. Now Nadab and Abihu died before the Lord. That was in Leviticus chapter 10. <clears throat> when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. So their line died out with them. And Eleazar and Ithamar, they ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron, their father. So here we are introduced to the priestly family. That's different than the Levites. They are Levites, but they are distinct from the Levite tribe. Now, it's very clear here because that they're different. It mentions in verse 3, these are the priests which were anointed, and in second, whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. No one else was smeared with the anointing oil to do that job. No one else was dedicated by God to this service like they were in Exodus 28. Why is that important? Because as we're going to go through the book of Numbers, their position is going to be challenged by those who are jealous of them. So the second generation, remember the recipients of this book, by the time this book's written, all that first generation's dead except for Joshua, Caleb, Moses. So the second generation who's reading, they needed to understand that from the start, God picked Aaron's family. Not Moses, that was not, well, Moses, you picked him because he's your brother. No, God picked him. In fact, I think after the whole golden calf fiasco, Moses probably wanted nothing to do with that. I imagine when the Lord came to uh, Moses and said, now Moses wants you to anoint Aaron to be the priest. I'm, I'm sure there's probably a little bit of a debate going on there. I don't want him to be my sidekick. He's a bad sidekick, you know? <laughs> you know. And yet the Lord says, no, I've called him to this. I want to restore him. I want him to do this. So God chose Aaron and his family, not Moses, not the nation. There was no vote. You know, it wasn't like, you know, you know, Aaron won the electoral vote. You know, that's not how it worked, right? He didn't take Florida and it was it, you know? God picked them. And they needed to understand that. And you know what also? Aaron needed to understand that. His descendants needed to understand that because leaders must never be hirelings. You know, look how well Israel did when they got the most qualified man for the job as their first king. Remember, Saul stood what? Head and shoulders above every other man. He was head and shoulders above every other man. He was the most qualified guy for the job of king. And yet he was not a man for God's own heart like David. And look how that worked out. Leaders are to be called by God and yielded to God alone, not people pleasers who are meeting the desires of their electorate. And this is especially true in the body of Christ. You know, 2 Timothy chapter four, Paul tells me, he says, you preach the word, Timothy. He says, you preach the word because there's gonna come a time when men are not gonna listen to sound doctrine and they're gonna heap up after themselves, pile up. And they're gonna be piles of these guys. They're gonna be one on every corner. Those who will tickle their ears, who will teach what they want to hear, say what will make them feel good, you know? And they'll have million dollar smiles and it'll be great. That is not what God calls a leader to do. There are times that God calls a leader to do hard things, whether political, in a church, you know, in a, in a family. If you are the head of your family, God calls you to do hard things sometimes. Things that your family may not like, but things that you need to do that are important. You know, the kids will, oh, really? You know, we're going to do this? Yes, we're going to do this because it's what God wants us to do and it's important. I, you know, I, <laughs> I get it. The enemy is out there and you already feel like a big enough loser as it is, dad. I get it. So when God calls you to do the home Bible study and you sit down with the kids and they're sitting there at the table like this, you know, wait until they can get back on their video games or whatever. And you're thinking, why even bother? You cannot do that. <laughs> Leaders, we're not a, we're not, we don't need psychophants. We don't have people that go, Father, you're the most wonderful spiritual leader in the world. Teach me more of the word of God. <laughs> if you have children like that, praise God, you know? 
But generally speaking, the reason they need you is because they're not like that. They need someone who will stand in the gap for them, who will say, I will do this, you know? I, hear, I see men all the time, well, they, you know, hey, it's so nice to see you. I haven't been to church in a while. I've missed you. Well, Pastor, well, you know, my wife, she just doesn't like coming to church. What do you mean she doesn't like coming to church? There's no like involved here, you know? If my wife comes to me and she says, I love her. She is my joy. She is my beautiful one, everything. But if she says to me, I don't like coming to church, I tell her, you're coming to church. We go to church. If my kids say, I don't like coming to church, I don't care. You're living under my roof, you're coming to church. We go to church, it's what we do. If you don't like it, then find another father. <laughs> God calls leaders to lead. And sometimes that means doing hard things. And you don't be rude about it, I'm being silly right now, but you know, with kindness and gentleness, you, you address the situation. You know, you would speak to that spouse or your kids and go, listen, you, there's no option here where we don't go to church. We don't, you know, we, we don't walk with the Lord here. Like, that's not the option. What is the problem? Like, what's the challenge? What's the difficulty? You know, well, I don't think anybody likes me. Okay, well, is that the Lord or is that the enemy telling you that? You know, I don't, I don't feel like I'm a part. Okay, well, let's, let's find a way to feel a part. How can I come alongside and help you with that? You know, you can't back down just because it's hard. You can't back down just because it's hard. Leaders have to lead. That wasn't in my notes, it was for free. Verse five, <laughs> I'm not gonna get to four, I'm barely gonna get done with three. Well, verse five, here we get to the Levites. Now the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron and the priests that they may minister unto him. So here we see that God calls the Levites to help in the tabernacle. Now this in and of itself is a miracle of grace because remember who Levi was? He was the guy when he found out that Dinah, their sister, that the Shechem, I think was his name, he had slept with his sister, that he went and technically raped is what the Bible indicates, raped his sister. They went and they said, well, you can marry our sister, but <laughs> here's the deal we have a tradition in our family and you can't marry her unless you follow that tradition. You've got to be circumcised. Everybody in town. And so while everybody is on the worst day when they're really feeling the pain, they go into the city and they slaughter every single one. The Bible says that was Simeon and Levi's idea. Jacob on his deathbed, he said, you two, I wouldn't even enter into any of your secret conversations because you're violent, wicked boys. And he disqualified them from being the prominent one. And yet here we see that God chooses the descendants of Levi, a miracle of grace. And he says, bring them near. This will be the first group besides Moses and Aaron who can draw near to serve the Lord in the tabernacle. A tremendous honor, but also a serious responsibility. So God outlines their role. And they have three responsibilities to help in the tabernacle. It says here that they will be brought before Aaron and the, pri Aaron the priest because they're gonna minister to him. The word their minister means to serve as an attendant, to be an assistant. So they will be basically the priest's sidekicks. Anything they need help with, they're there to serve serve them. Secondly, they shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation. The phrase they're keeping the charge, it means to be a guard over someone's responsibilities. So their job was to be the inspectors of the process, ensuring that nothing unholy or out of order approached God's presence. So that's where their buffer zone would be. So like if you were going to come to the Lord, before you even got to the priest, they would check you out. You'd be like, are you unclean? Let me check you out. Okay, you're not unclean. Is the animal unclean? No, the animal's unclean. Okay, what are you here for? Oh, I'm here because I would like to bring a peace offering. Okay, you realize this isn't the right animal, right? You need to bring a different animal. They would be the ones to go through that whole process and make sure that if you got to the priest, everything was as it was supposed to be. So when you went in, you would not be crispy crittered by God, okay? That was, they were to ensure that. So they were to be the assistants. They were to be the inspectors of the process. Now, by the way, this also included the responsibility of going to the tribes 
and teaching them God's law because they wouldn't know it. It's not like they had Bibles everywhere back then. So their job was to go throughout all the land of Israel when they got into the promised land and their job was to be the Bible teachers. The Levites were to instruct the people of the process as well as inspect them when they came to make sure everything was done according to the process. So that was their second job. Now, what's interesting about that is they didn't do that job. We'll get to that later. Thirdly, they were to do the service of the tabernacle. It says here, and they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. So their third job was to set up, tear down, and transport all the utensils, all the furniture, and all the structure of the tabernacle, right? Now, there was a serious commitment that this role required, verse nine. And you shall give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. And you shall appoint Aaron and his sons and they shall wait on their priest's office and the stranger that comes near shall be put to death. That phrase wholly given in the Hebrew, they didn't have a word for emphasis. So to do it, they would double letter, double words. So the word there, they shall be given, given. You know, they were not to engage in any other activities but these, lest they become distracted from their duties. They weren't to go to war, which is why they weren't counted in the first census, because that was a census of the fighting men. They were not to engage in personal financial success. None of those things. In fact, the word here is interesting, forgiven. It's the word nethanim. Now, you might find that familiar if you're a student of your Bible, because we'll see that word later in the Bible to describe those who became the Levites' assistants. Apparently, they didn't like this menial title of nethanim. And so the Levites, they eventually brought these guys in. They would basically be foreigners who came in. They said, we want to serve the Lord. And they said, well, yeah, you can serve the Lord. You can do the stuff we don't want to do, you know? So they did all the menial tasks after that. And you know what the Levites did? Nothing, nothing. They didn't do anything. It wasn't until David's day that he put them into groups and they started doing the work of the tabernacle like they were supposed to. This attitude bore horrible fruit later on in Israel's history when things became hard for the Levites financially. People weren't tithing, they weren't giving. And so they ended up bailing on their responsibilities to Aaron and the priest's descendants, as well as teaching the word of God to Israel. So much so that God had to raise up prophets to teach the people's commands because the Levites weren't doing their job. In Elijah's day, there was a school of prophets. And the only reason a school of prophets existed is because the Levites weren't doing their job. What lessons can we learn from that? Well, I think a great lesson is that there's great value in doing whatever God tells us to do, right? And whatever God calls you to do, it's awesome. You know, whatever he calls you to do, if he's the one calling you to do it, that's what makes it awesome, period. Secondly, leadership is about serving, not being served or being honored by others. It's about serving others. And thirdly, good leaders don't take the job because it pays the bills. They serve God obediently, trusting him to take care of their needs. Now, there's this little phrase here in verse 10. It says they need to do this. Why? So that the stranger that comes near shall not be put to death. Or, I'm sorry, and it says, and the stranger that does come near shall be put to death. Only the tribe of Levi had this role. Anyone else would be considered a foreigner to come to the tabernacle. This isn't a, a blight against foreigners or racism or anything like that. It's just anyone who would come close to do that job who hadn't been appointed by God, they were considered a foreigner. They did not belong in that place. So this was to protect the people from trying to worship God in their own way. I hear people say it all the time, well, I worship God in my own way. You realize that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as worshiping God my own way. The very nature of worship can never be my own way because the heart of worship is submission to his way. The very, it can't, like it's an oxymoron. It's about love for him, not love for me. It's about what he thinks, not what I think. Now, this was also to protect the people from inadvertently worshiping God incorrectly. He didn't want anyone to perish from a mistake. And doesn't that show how merciful our God is? He has a perfect standard, but he still wants none to perish even though we make lots of mistakes. Now, why did God choose an entire tribe for this? Well, remember, if you go back to Exodus, originally he chose the firstborn for this job. So verse 11, God explains he's taking the entire tribe of Levi instead of the firstborn. Verse 11. Verse 11. 
And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, And I, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that opens the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed or set apart unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast, mine they shall be, I am the Lord. Now, everything belongs to God, right? I mean, if God says, you're mine, I mean, that's true, right? Everything you have is mine, that's all true. And yet, he stated that the firstborn were specially his because he wanted a group to serve him and to serve his people. Now, the firstborn will always belong to him because he spared them during the Passover. They still belong to him, but the Levites will serve in their stead. That would be much more organized, a much easier way to do things. So God decides he's gonna use the whole tribe of Levi. Now, when we couple this with the life of Levi, we see a beautiful picture of the cross. We who were born, who were disqualified from blessing and service by our sin, now we get to do so instead of the firstborn, Jesus, the only one who's earned that right. Isn't that cool? Like Jesus isn't here doing that. He chooses us in his place, right? He redeems us, he forgives us, and he equips us. He makes us worthy to serve him. That's what Paul said. He goes, I'm not worthy to do this, but he counted me worthy, putting me in the ministry. And so as you can serve the Lord, because even though Jesus is the firstborn, the only begotten son of God, whom he's well pleased with, God has redeemed you and me. And now we can serve him as well in Christ's stead. Now, that their role's been settled, the counting must be done and they must be given their specific responsibilities in the camp. So verse 14, and the Lord spoke unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai saying, number or count the children of Israel, Levi after the house of their fathers by their families. Every male from a month old and upward shall you number them. And Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord as he was commanded. So here we see that Moses does exactly what God tells him to do. It mentions here that they would be counted differently than the soldiers. This would be every male from a month old and upward. So since this is for the purpose of serving and not fighting, every male could be counted on since they'll eventually serve. And I love this here that Moses says he numbered them according to the word of the Lord as he was commanded. And I don't know about you, but I want to do everything I do in life. I want to do it because it's according to God's word. Amen? You know, that's the best place to be, right where God tells us to be in his word. So anyway, I have more, but that's a good stopping point. As much as I would like to keep going, it's late. So we'll pick it up here in verse 18 as we learn more about the Levites in chapter three and chapter four next, well, not next week, we'll be at the beach next week, but then two weeks from tonight, uh, we will reconvene in verse 18 of chapter three in Numbers. So read chapter three and four for next week and sometime in the next couple of years we'll get done with Numbers. Let's all stand. Lord, what a great start. And thus they did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. Thus Moses did all according to as you told him, Lord. That, I want that to be my testimony. I want, we want that to be our testimony tonight, Lord. And so, Lord, right now, there, there may be some of us here tonight who we, you've told us to do things in your word and, and we haven't been doing it, Lord. Right now, we commit to you to be obedient and faithful in those areas. Lord, to do what you say in your word, to continue our race, Lord, to continue our journey doing things your way. Because we want to live in that abundant life, that promised land life that you offer to us now. We are victorious over our enemies. So Lord, we yield ourselves to you now. We choose to obey you. And as we read your word this week, Lord, we commit to you right now that whatever we read, we're gonna do according to all that you say. And all God's people said, amen. That means so be it. That's your, your commitment. You know, that's what I wanna do. So let's uh, commit that to him as we sing it. Amen.